Thanks, Bogla. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, welcome, everyone. I hope by the end of this session, you will uh, have learned some techniques to, to break into buildings. So if you've forgotten your house keys, like, you know, what do you do in that case? Maybe try to use a plastic shame or try maybe to drill through, uh, through the, the, the security lock. Maybe you'll get access to your house. Um, but anyway, uh, I put this talk together. Uh, I mean, Bogla like did a very good intro. Uh, I think physical security is not very often taken in consideration when it's related to digital assets. Um, and I've been trying to identify what that's the case, you know, how often, how common are physical threat actors, uh, and when they get in an organization, what kind of impact can they have? Uh, just a quick intro about myself. Uh, so I've been in offensive security for the last 10 years, uh, focused you know, on penetration testing, uh, network, application, wireless, Fishing, dishing, all these kind of things, but by far physical breach are my favorite uh, kind of gigs. Um, so uh, I started thinking of you know what what kind of what's what the most um, well known stories where a physical threat has had an impact on digital assets. Uh, and John, our previous speaker, is gonna stole my uh, my first slide here. <laughs> he already introduced it, but Stuxnet is kind of the obvious, right? Just to uh, to recap for anyone listening online. Uh, Stuxnet was uh, a worm that impacted the Iranian nuclear plant. And in order to, um, you know, to, to get that worm uh, into the nuclear plant, um, a malicious scientist was kind of paid uh, to go on site and plug a USB stick because the nuclear plant was an OT environment. It wasn't connected to IT or to the internet. So the only way really was for a physical threat actor to walk in and uh, plug the USB stick. Um, so that, that uh, Stuxnet did cause severe delay into the Iranian nuclear plant. Uh, it, it caused them to, I think, several years of delay as a result. Um, but um, uh, I mean, who, who were the who were the, the culprit in this attack? It's, it's thought that it was uh, the United States and Israel, because apparently uh, they, they thought that uh, Iran was using the nuclear plant to develop the atomic bomb, when Iran was saying that it was just used for uh, creating power. Um, so that, that's uh, kind of the, the first story, probably the most well-known, where the impact was the greatest. Uh, I started looking for other stories of physical breach in the news. Uh, they are not actually that easy to find, uh, but a few of them that I wanted to mention. Um, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, where a physical threat actor was playing in the casino uh, and managed actually to hack through an interconnected fish tank, uh, gain access to the internal network, and then gain access to the high roller database. Of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of the, the players in the casino, right? It's a pretty interesting story. Capcom, which is a video game company based in Japan, where the threat actor managed to actually walk in the office, uh, grab a couple of servers and workstation, uh, went back home, uh, scrapped the data from these digital assets, and then held the company for ransom. So again, pretty big impact here from just stolen equipment. Ukraine, um, threat actor uh, attacked the, uh, uh, electric, uh, uh, the electric grid uh, and managed to, I mean, with physical access to the OT environment, they managed to hack uh, the electric grid and cause some blackouts. So I'm sure we can all imagine who is behind that attack, obviously. And finally, uh, maybe a little bit less impactful story, but I kind of wanted to mention in passing is the Iowa Athletic Club, which is a university in the States where the threat actor disguised as a delivery driver uh, managed to walk in the university and stole $20,000 of Apple product, right? And probably a few laptops. Apple products are quite expensive nowadays. Um, but yeah, so you, you see that basically physical breach can lead to various kind of different impact uh, against an organization when the threat actor does walk in. Um, so yeah, organizations spend a lot of money trying to secure the seven different uh, layers of cybersecurity. But oftentimes, a threat actor can just take get someone through the front door, steal some assets, and pretty much get access to the crown jewels. And so I've been trying to understand why is it not more common for organizations to do this kind of, of security assessment? Because you know, I, I do some, but it's, they are very rare. And when I ask for colleagues working in other organizations, they tell me the same thing. You know, organizations, are, uh, customers, are generally are not that interested in this kind of gigs. Uh, so what, what's the reason? Um, so I started looking in the, yeah, the, the F-bomb first, <laughs> the, the, the frameworks. Uh, there's a multitude of frameworks that exist, Tiber, EU, CBEST, you know, all regions have different frameworks. Um, and how often is 
physical security mentioned in this <coughs> framework and do they try to tie it to a digital security? So I didn't do this work myself. Uh, I used, uh, obviously, ChatGPT version 4, all right, <laughs> to automatically read this document and just extract me the information I was interested in. So hopefully it's correct, who knows. But anyway, that's what it says, that uh, the vast majority of this framework focus on digital security aspect with physical security addressed either separately or just as a completely distinct component. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that frameworks don't require organization to do this physical test. And that's one of the reasons why they may not be interested in, in doing security assessments, physical breach. The second reason, I've got five reasons that I've tried um, to, to, to put together, uh, is, a, is a risk matrix, right? Uh, what's the likelihood that a threat actor is going to walk in and try to compromise an organization? Well, for a normal, you know, uh, everyday, uh, small organization or medium size, it's, it's, it's probably unlikely. Like, if you want to hack into an organization, you're probably going to try to, you know, hack something that's on the internet and get access to the IT network, or otherwise try to send a phishing campaign and, again, like, pop a workstation. Um, but going on site, you know, there's a certain level of risk. So for an organization that just has an IT network, that's probably unlikely. For an organization that has an OT network that's not connected to the internet, that the only way really to, to hack that organization is to go on site. So <laughs> the, 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 the probability is a little bit higher, probably you know, unlikely to, to moderate grade. And what's the impact? Well, the impact like any attacks can vary. And that's what I was trying to explain really in this kind of four or five stories at the beginning. The impact can be quite low when you are just, the threat actor just steal you know, four or five workstation. But it's a little bit higher when the steel workstation scrap the data and head the company for ransom or it's even extremely high or severe when the threat actor caused blackout within the country or uh, hit the, the, the nuclear plant of the country. Um, a, a third reason is the ownership. Um, so we like to think that um, uh, physical security, the building security, and the, the, the information security department will work hand in hand because they both have to protect the digital assets of the company and make sure that the business keeps on going. But for any people that work in any organization, generally the partners don't work together. Like they have their, their own agendas uh, and they are not really interested in sharing budgets. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, that's one of the reasons the information security department will just focus on digital assets and the building security will focus on physical security, but they will never really work hand in hand, unfortunately. The, th the second reason is oftentimes there's different ownership. And then specifically speaking to um, a building with multiple tenants, right? A building that has several floors where different organizations own different floors. The building security will not be managed by the organizations themselves. It will be managed by a third party. And the third party might not really want anyone to try to, to, to walk in. They might not actually provide authorization for this kind of activity. So it's, again, a challenge in this kind of situation. Uh, the, the fourth reason is the cost, right? Cost a lot of money. Uh, you have to travel to go on site. You have to pay for food and accommodation. Generally, you require multiple consultants um, to, to work together. You know, it's kind of a, a physical red team. So you know, a team, two people at least. Uh, and two people can be used for various different pretexts as well. What do you do when you have multiple sites? You know, do you target the headquarter? Do you target the uh, satellite office? Do you do that for every single site? It's going to cost a lot of money if you do. And finally, it's a niche skill set, right? The, the, the people that can do this kind of physical intrusion uh, need obviously to be, have a background in pen testing so they can you know, the target the digital assets, but they also know to know about physical security. And where do you learn that skill set? Typically, either in the army or in the, in the police forces. Um, so that's not my background, but uh, that's, why I, that's how I was taught by, by other people, right? For my colleagues that came that, as veterans and were able to teach me um, you know, what, what, what kind of issues to look for uh, when trying to get into a building. And finally, there's the complications. Um, so there's uh, two handsome guys here, uh, Justin and Gary, uh, works for a company called Coldfire. You probably heard of that story. Uh, I suppose it was in 2019. Uh, and they tried to break into the Iowa, again, so in the States, uh, the Iowa County Courthouse. Um, 
that was legit. They were paid by, uh, by, by, the, by the county to, uh, to do this kind of activity. Uh, and, uh, and they were caught. Um, so basically, they, they tried to get in uh, to open the, the door. They used a plastic shim, opened the latch, and then the alarm started ringing. Um, soon after, the sheriff showed up, and the sheriff asked them for the get, uh, they asked them what's going on. So they showed the, the get out of jail letter, which is here on the right, that showed that they have actually, um, they are actually allowed to do this, this kind of activity, and we list a bunch of things. Laser, yeah, a bunch of things that they are allowed and things they are not, not allowed to do, as well as contact of who should be called in such an event. Um, so, uh, you know, the sheriff started running through that, um, and he was like, you are not allowed to force open doors, you use the plastic shame. Is it forcing the door open? Mm, I don't know, it's up to interpretation. So it was, it was a little bit uh, dubious there. Uh, then he claimed that the, the two guys tried to, um, to disconnect the alarm, which they say that it wasn't true. Uh, and finally, he started going through every single point of contact to see if they're answering their phone and giving authorization for the activity. And one out of the three didn't answer. And uh, that was a good enough reason to, say, to send the two guys in jail for the night. Uh, so Gary and Justin, unfortunately, yeah, did end up going to jail. And the next day, Cold Fire had to uh, submit a bail of $100,000 uh, to get them out. Uh, but it actually dragged on after for six months. Again, it went into a lot of uh, legal issues. Uh, and uh, and I, yeah, basically, I'm not going to say the, the whole story, but uh, Darkling Diaries, episode 59, if you listen to it, uh, 85 minutes of content, so I don't have time to go through all of it. But there are complications, and that's why providers that do this kind of physical engagements have to make sure that they are covered in the event of their, their people being arrested by law enforcement. So how do we get in? Um, and I wanted to touch on three aspects, um, on remotely, on-site, and then in the internal network, right? So I've got basically a bunch of uh, war stories going forward. Um, the first one is, well, what kind of uh, uh, remote intelligence can we get from just you know, sitting in the house before even going on-site? Um, oftentimes, we see that buildings uh, are not owned by an organization. They are owned by you know, um, a, a landlord that owns that building, and they will let it to someone else. Uh, they might let different floors to different organizations, for example, multi-tenants. Uh, and this marketing brochure can really help in identifying, well, what, what, what's inside that building? You know, is, there, is it a ground floor? Is it public? Uh, do they have like coffee shops? Do they have a restaurant? Um, what's the floor layout looking like? And sometimes it's shown. It's shown floor by floor, the layout of different floors. Um, so where are the toilets? Where are the fire emergency stairwell? Where are the lift? And it's a lot of details that can be used just to get a plan in your head before even going on site about what, what to expect when you get there. Another one that, that I love is, uh, and this is just example, it's not buildings we've targeted, uh, <laughs> but uh, another one that I love is organizations when they move to uh, their new fancy uh, high-spec offices. Uh, where they've got you know, that cool uh, pool table or the air hockey space or uh, the beer fridge. They love to uh, post on YouTube uh, a video about it uh, to show why they're awesome, right? why it should work for us. Uh, and this video can be very useful for threat actors because oftentimes it will disclose you know, what kind of uh, access control is used on, on doors. Um, what are the employees wearing? You know, is it business casual? Is it formal attire? What do the lanyard look like? What color? Can I see a picture of their badge? And again, a ton of information that can be used before even going on site to know, knowing, well, do I need to bring a shirt or a pair, a pair of flip-flops? <laughs> do I need uh, a red or black lanyard? Can I potentially try to print a similar badge before even showing up? Um, and yeah, some information that can be used again just remotely by doing some remote reconnaissance. In terms of pretext, um, so we've been actually successful with this one uh, fairly recently. Uh, and again, that's just a random guy I found on Google. Um, but when uh, an organization rents uh, a uh, floor in a, in a specific building, a multi-tenant building, uh, oftentimes there will be other floors available in that building. So you can, threat actor, uh, can contact uh, you know, the, the landlord or the, the person that, um, that's renting this space and ask them for a visit of that floor available, available floor on the building. And actually recently we were able to compromise the office space because we got a, a visit in, a, in the building that we are targeting. 
and then we ask that person if we could see the floor just above where it was our target company, uh, just to see actually how it looked like when there was a company inside. And the guy was like, yeah, yeah, no problem, badges in, and uh, <laughs> here we go, got access to, to, to the floor of the company we are targeting. Another one, uh, we, we've only tried this one once. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to do it uh, for just for reasons of times and uh, schedule. Uh, but if a company is an IT job opening, then I'm definitely going to try to apply for it. And you can use you know, ChatGPT very quickly to generate a, a CV for yourself. So yeah, there's limited work here. Uh, but try to apply for a job and then see if you can get an on-site interview. And when you get the on-site interview, obviously you work in the building, you work in the office. Are they always with you? Or can you potentially try to steal something or plank, plant a, a Dropbox or a computer in the network and try to get remote access to it? Um, so ten different pretexts uh, that can be used uh, ahead of time uh, to prepare for the physical bridge. So I've got uh, what six six stories uh, of how we managed to get internal access on, on recent engagements. Uh, this one probably not so recent. It was actually my first gig ever um, doing a physical bridge. Um, we drove to site and uh, it, was, it was a young it was a, a new building, maybe five years old. They had security guards, uh, they had man traps, so you could only go one person at a time, you couldn't tailgate anyone. Um, so, you know, I didn't really know how, how to approach, uh, how, how, how to get into this building. But what we found is they had a car park underneath the building. And that car park required uh, employees to badge in, and that would open the door, and then they would drive in, okay? Um, so I'd rented, rented a car for, for, for this engagement. Uh, I didn't take any insurance, unfortunately. Oh, anyway, I didn't take any insurance, so I was like, well, you know, sweaty palm, first day. I'm going to try to move driving and just kind of tailgate with the car someone in the parking lot. Uh, so employee comes in, badge in, the, the barrier opens up, start driving in, and uh, yeah, rev very high, I revved up very high, <laughs> I managed to tailgate that car into the parking lot. Um, so we parked the car, and there wasn't much we could do. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, the door from the car the car park was going to the ground floor, and then there were man traps, so you couldn't actually go anywhere. Uh, but what we found is there were security cameras that were plugged into Ethernet ports, uh, and these Ethernet ports were not protected. So from the Ethernet port with the security camera, we were actually able to hack the internal network from that organization. Very simple. Um, second story, right place at the right time. Um, so we showed up on site. Um, it was a multi-tenant building. Organization was on the fourth floor, let's say, um, and um, and again, you know, so we are just doing like some reconnaissance first day. It, we had a public area on the ground floor, so we just decided, well, let's just go for lunch and you know just see what what people do in that building, just to have a look around. Uh, and uh, I think it was uh, around dessert time. Uh, <laughs> at, at the end of the meal, um, there is uh, the fire alarm that started ringing, and all the employees of the entire building. Uh, started walking down, right, <laughs> uh, and meet up outside at the emergency spot. Um, so we decided, well, let's try like to, to mingle with these guys. Uh, let's uh, let's go and, uh, and join a group. Uh, and on the way back, uh, the the building had actually left all the, um, the the gates open. You didn't need badging anywhere. And obviously, there was a lot of people, so you could just go. So sorry, there was two of us. My colleague went through through the lift and were able to to go to the correct floor. And I just tailgated people into the stairs. As you can see, there are many employees, so everybody was just leaving the door open for the next one to get in. Uh, so a very easy way, again, to, to get into a building. Unfortunately, uh, you know, th that was just a lucky, uh, <laughs> a a lucky uh, uh, we were just very lucky. Uh, I don't think we'll ever get approval from the customer to actually like, ring the fire alarm and like, cause massive evacuation for, for this to, to be repeated ever again. Uh, but yeah, super lucky in that case. Batch cloning. Um, that's probably like our most common way of getting in, actually. Um, so depending on the encryption used on RFID batch, um, the one that are maybe 10 year old or so can be vulnerable to, to specific vulnerabilities that allow uh, a threat actor to clone them. Uh, so we've got two antennas, you know, low frequency, high frequency antenna, depending on the batch type. Um, and these antenna are the same ones that are used in car park, so they can read the batch by a two feet distance also, a little bit less when they are, they are in a backpack or in a, in a laptop bag. Um, but basically, we, we can use them to try to clone employees 
access badge, RFID access badge. Um, so, I mean, the technique that works is we'll uh, figure out where the employees, when they leave the building, where they go for coffee or lunch, and then we go and kind of queue next to them and kind of gently try like, to, uh, to, to bump into them <laughs> to, to get the badge read, because you need to be very close to them. Uh, so it's really awkward. You just you spend like a couple of hours kind of like looking like you are drunk pretty much, <laughs> you know, <laughs> trying to get badge read. Uh, but when you do get the badge, obviously, then you, you can clone it onto another badge, get authenticated access to the building, and uh, here you go. Social engineering. Um, yeah, social engineering techniques are good, but uh, obviously you don't want to be discovered, so there's, you know, you don't want to burn yourself too early. Uh, but that's probably one of my favorite stories of all time. And it kind of relates to the Iowa uh, Athletic Club when the delivery driver breached in. Well, guess what I did? I went on eBay uh, and purchased a DHL hat and a, a DHL jacket. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it was very legit. Like, it showed up to my house, the package showed up, and the DHL jacket had like some oil stain, and it was like a little bit marked, so it had been used before. Uh, and I decided to go to uh, this building and do a delivery. Picture off on site. I've got uh, my package uh, with like uh, the name of someone in the office, and uh, as, as I show that reception and say, "Yeah, I've got signed delivery for this person. I need to physically get them to sign." And uh, yeah, the receptionist just gave me the access badge. You can see in my hand and tell me, "Yeah, yeah, go upstairs, the third desk on the left, uh, <laughs> and do the delivery." And again, how I gain access to the building? Wireless. Um, so. Again, you know, when you speak about physical threat, it doesn't have to be just a physical attack. It can be by being right in near proximity of the building. And that's where wireless attacks can, can be quite useful. In this specific story, um, it was, a, again, a multi-tenant building. And the target company was very high up on the 25th floor or so uh, of the building. Uh, and they had security guards at the bottom floor. And when you, even if we have managed to tailgate someone, when they put their badge against the lift, it called a specific lift and it was only going to the floor of that employee. So we'll have to be really lucky out of hundreds of employees to find an employee working for that organization to be able to go to the correct floor. So that, that was impossible. What we found via, via online reconnaissance really was there was multiple organizations in that building and one of them was renting office space per the hour, right, meeting room. A little bit like bridges if you know them or you can just book a meeting room for an hour. Uh, so we decided, well, let's pay you know, 20 bucks and, uh, and rent uh, an, office book, an office room for an hour. So again, showed up at reception. We had a valid pretext. You know, we could go to the third floor and rent in the office room. Uh, so we sat down in that meeting room uh, for, for a few minutes. Uh, and when the receptionist on that floor were looking, we took the emergency stairwell and kind of started climbing our way up to, to our target office. We couldn't actually get in. There was no way of us getting into that office. But we found that underneath, there was a vacant floor. And that's literally a picture of on site, you know, sitting in that <laughs> vacant floor uh, on that massive table. Uh, and we managed, to, we managed to create a ROG access point, uh, capture some credentials, and then get access to the internal network via the wireless. So a very nice mix of uh, you know, physical to digital to get in. Uh, and finally, door bypass, uh, I guess, as some pretty, pretty simple door bypass I wanted to mention. Uh, lock picking is not actively used generally because you know, it takes a long time to try to lock pick a door and it can be quite complex. Uh, you want to be busted but trying to, to, to pick a lock. Uh, but here's a simple uh, bypass that uh, I, I came up with recently. I mean, maybe it was well known, but anyway, I kind of created it. And it's by just using sticky tape. Um, generally, I use transparent stick sticky tape rather than yellow, but I just wanted to show it on, on my back door to show exactly why it works. Uh, but basically, like the sticky tape on the door frame is sticky, it's stuck to, the door, to uh, uh, that door frame, uh, but that, that overlap here is not sticky, which means that if an employee is going to exit that door, so from, from the inside out, it's going to push the door, and on the way back when the door is closed, that, that flap here is going to be stuck in the latch, and the latch will basically remain open. And it's a very nice little trick using just a little bit of tape, so very cheap, right? <laughs> uh, to, to, yeah, to avoid from a door from closing. Um, and you know, when you push a door open, you never really pay attention to what's you know, in the bottom right corner, specifically if it's uh, transparent tape. 
Another one uh, that I used on site recently was a under the door tool. Uh, so maybe you have heard of it. Uh, under the door tools can be used when you have a little gap under the door and they can, there's no handles around, but they can be used to, you shove the under the door tool and then you grab the handle on the other side and you put the door open. But unfortunately, we showed up on site and they did not have that tool. Uh, I wasn't prepared. Uh, but what we did is go to the nearest DIY shop, uh, bought a steel rod and a steel wire and pretty much created it out of uh, what's, yeah, 20 euro out of material, so it's a pretty cheap. Uh, and then we showed up on site, and hopefully the video is gonna work. It was a transparent door, so I, I love this video because you can actually see what, what's happening. Uh, but that, that bit, the metal rod, is on the other side. It's been inserted underneath, and then it's gonna go on the handle, and I'm gonna pull that wire, and hopefully it works. But it works, obviously. A little bit noisy. <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> I had once filmed on site and uh, I sent uh, the customer afterwards a WhatsApp video of <laughs> telling him that we pushed in. Uh, yeah, I mean, took us, you know, what, 30 seconds to literally pop open, pop, pop open that door. So, what do we do when we get in? And I think that's kind of a area that I want to focus a little bit of time um, because oftentimes organizations think, well, it's, you know, you can, you know, they just want to test, are you able to walk in, but they don't really push it a little bit further. You know, what can an, a threat actor or physical threat do with that internal access? You know, what, what are the objectives? And it's really a conversation that we have with our, with our customers generally, you know, what, what do you want us to achieve? What are the main concerns? Uh, sometimes we look for simple things, you know, uh, passwords and, and sticky notes. You know, they do happen very often. <laughs> Other times we look for PII data of, uh, of clients potentially, the sensitive data that's left on desk that's not been shredded. Oftentimes, uh, sensitive data can be found in the, in the, in the little, um, how do you call that, cabinets, in the little cabinets. And even if they are closed, actually, that lock picking can be uh, very effective against these locks because they are very low security. And the, the, one of the great things is uh, if you target a receptionist and you try to, to pop open the, the, that cabinet here, uh, they will often have keys for all the area of the building and oftentimes can lead to opening safe. That, uh, you know, there will be a highly secure safe with a key in a less secure area. Very common. What do we do when, when you actually gain access? So we, we, we can do this, but oftentimes I've got customers that tell me, well, you know, if you have a test, we, we use NAC. So even if you try to plug in to our Ethernet, via our internal network, you won't get access to anything. Uh, and we have encrypted hard drive, right? So even if you steal the laptop, you won't be able to gain access to the data on it. At least that's what they think. Uh, there's many attacks nowadays for uh, bypassing NAC. Uh, one of the ones that I've used recently is called Dolos JS, where you basically uh, have to insert a box, it's kind of a man in the middle attack. You have to access a, uh, insert a box between the access switch and the victim laptop. And that box will act as a transparent bridge uh, and be able to inject traffic into the network. So basically the, the NAC control can be bypassed very easily. Um, oftentimes we just plug that box in and we get uh, communication to our command and control via LTE modem, so via 4G or via Wi-Fi. How do you bypass, uh, so let's say uh, you get into site and then there's a laptop that is locked. How do you actually get credentials to, to log into the laptop? Bashbunny, right? <laughs> Bashbunny from Hack5, uh, there's a module called Creeds. So if you've got a locked laptop, you know, it's asking you a username and password, you can just insert it in and then the Bashbunny will emulate a network interface and start running a man in the middle attack. Right, responder, and that will grab uh, the NTLMv2 credentials, you can crack them to clear text, and that will reveal the password of that user. So for customers that say, yeah, still a laptop, you won't be able to do anything about it, well, <laughs> there's a very easy bypass using a bash bunny. And finally, internal network. So again, it just depends on the objectives that, uh, that were listed by the customer, but we always plan to Dropbox when you get into an organization. 
um, just uh, my kind of paint uh, <laughs> description <laughs> of uh, how we do this uh, is we plant our Dropbox here into the internal network. That Dropbox con uh, is connects via wireless to our LTE modem. The LTE modem connects to the internet. So we don't have to actually send any traffic internally to, to reach our command and control server. And also keyloggers. Keyloggers are super useful. They come in very small factors like this. You just plug them at the back of a keyboard and it will record everything that's been typed in, send it to the LTE modem, and send it back to our command and control server. Quick example of how we had an easy win recently. Uh, so we got internal access, and that customer had name plates on their, on their desk that were showing you know, the person sitting at each and every desk. Uh, so we went on LinkedIn, figured out who is the IT administrator of that company, uh, planted a keylogger, and just waited for the next day for the guy to log in and got domain admin creds and pop them within like a few minutes. So our conclusion, as I reach the time, brilliant. Um, physical security and digital security must work hand in hand. That's why I'm trying to, to put to that presentation. It's very important that not only to focus on the physical threat, but to make the correlation with the digital threat. Uh, to enforce background security checks for employees and contractors. Uh, to have security awareness for tailgating, clean desk policy, sensitive data shredding. Something I didn't go into details is uh, you know, dumpster diving, for example, where you can find PII data. I've actually never done it because that's probably not my favorite uh, attack technique. <laughs> uh, LX security champions. If you have an organization and you're trying to secure uh, your, your, your internal, uh, your offices, there's probably the employees that go there every single day will probably know what the issues are. So elect the security champions and ask them to, to report on the, any vulnerabilities that, that, that they see. Enforce surveillance on our entry points. Uh, when you have a door or you know, uh, an, an entry point, it's important to have a security camera that's filming it. Because if someone steals a badge or clone a badge, then they can just get in. And you have no really way of telling if that person stole that badge. Uh, if that's really that person, it's because you don't have any footage of it. Right? So it's important to have a video surveillance on our entry point. And finally, test your response capabilities to intruders. That one is. We had an, an engagement recently when we managed to, to pop in, no, to, to break into a building, and we knew that actually had an alarm system, but the person that, uh, it was a third party company that was managed to, that needed to, to respond when an alarm is triggered, it took them over half an hour to show up on site, and by that time, we had planted our Dropbox, we had planted our key loggers, and we were actually gone, and they had actually no way to figure out, because they didn't have any video surveillance, what had happened that night. So yeah, that was my, uh, I'll find out talk about physical rush. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> yes.